Wise as scientists have worked, studied, and searched all their life long for the actual knowledge of God and have failed to obtain it. Finally, they form their own opinions of God. Our lessons teach us that me and my people have tried this mystery God for bread, clothing, and a home. And we received nothing but hard times, hunger, naked, and out of dawn. Also, we're beaten killed by the ones who advocated that kind of God. And no relief came to us until the Son of Man came to our aid by the name of our prophet, W.D. Farrar. So what Mr. Vakian, vis-a-vis Ms. Taylor, has done is set up what you call a straw man argument. Yes, sir. Which is this, is that straw man is something that's easily knocked down. Mystery God don't exist, so it's easy to disprove that which don't exist. So it's a straw man, you knock it down. And, they, they, and, and what has happened is they have only succeeded in proving what we already knew. Right. There is no mystery God. Right. Yes, so our counterclaim is that God, the God that she described, is actually a black anthropomorphic God, right. meaning he came in, he's, he's a human form, that the Greeks borrowed from the Egyptians, right. changed into a mystery, then peddled him back to the Hebrews, the Christians, and the old world Muslims. The God of the original people, such as the Sumerians, the Indus Valley, the original Arabians, the Nile Valley civilizations, always depicted God as a man that looked like them, that meant he was black. For them, the supreme being is a man, has always been a man, and will always be a man. Lastly, to worship anything other than man as God is to worship less than man as God. Man is in his exalted state is God. And God in his fallen state is man. And man in his fallen state is a savage. And savage is a one who's lost the knowledge of himself and living a beast life. Communism, claim number two, communism is better than religion. When you trace the etymological root of religion, it means to reread or to read again. Contrary to Ms. Taylor's position, one could claim that Allah God has a sense of humor. His first command to the prophet Muhammad, who couldn't read and write, was read. That was his first command to a man that couldn't read and write. The first revelation of the Holy Quran says, read. Read in the name of thy Lord, who creates, creates man from a clock. Read in thy Lord is most generous, who taught man by the pen. Man couldn't write, but he taught man by the pen. Who taught man by the pen what man knew not. Religion was established by men. To remind them of what they forgot they were. I'll say it again. Religion was established by men to remind them of what they once were and will be. Over time, man got lost in the symbols, the signs, the ceremonies, the doxology, the eschatology, the theology, and they forgot the temporary purpose of religion. The Holy Quran says that Allah gave us Islam as a religion, but Islam is not a religion. Islam is actually the nature in which man was created. It's not a religion. In the Temple of Luxor and in the pyramids, they were not built to honor a mystery God, but the chambers were built to correspond to the human body, the real temple of the living God. The lyrics of Stevie Wonder's song are most appropriate for this occasion. When you believe in things that you don't understand, you suffer, superstition ain't the way. But what do you call disbelief in something you don't understand? You declare it to be non-existent and detrimental because you don't understand it. How do you describe a sophisticated form of superstition? Masking irrationality and passing itself off as reason and rationality. Without mincing words, we call it ignorance. Let us stipulate, Dr. Clevin or Professor Clevin for the record, that ignorance, I'm stipulating that ignorance means illiterate, and illiterate means ignorant. To be ignorant does not mean to be an insult to Ms. Taylor. It doesn't mean that she's not intelligent, or any of you are not intelligent. But rather, it is to be stubborn, to ignore, ignore, listen to ignorance, to ignore that which is right in front of your face, or as I'm telling you, that God was always portrayed as a man, it's not what's right in front of your face, it's what in your mirror. So stop looking in the sky for some, somebody in the suite by and by after you die, get you something sound on the ground where you're still around. That's where God is. Our counterclaim is, 
communism is not better than religion. I say this with deepest humility. In it is the final phase before communism is the final phase before theocracy. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan says that sexism, racism, classism, and rapid nationalism are impediments to self-improvement, which are the basis of community development. If evolutionary science is true, then man is destined to evolve into the full use of his mind. I'll say it again. He said, Muslim, talk about evolution. Yes. You say it's science, then let's go for it. If evolutionary science is true, then a man that uses only 3 to 8% of his mind will eventually evolve to be able to use 100% of his mind. Now, if you look at a person who uses 3% of his mind, and he meets a person that uses 100% of his mind, that person that uses 100% of his mind would be a God, yes, sir. especially to you and me, because he would not be limited to that which limits us. Man's mind, Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, is infinite. He's infinite. So, let's move on. Right now, if Marx is right, he said man is a social creature. I agree with that. But social creatures like fish swim in schools, and there's always a lead fish. So if we abolish all property, we abolish all sexism, racism, bigotry, anything, anti-Semitism, anything that holds us back, that I don't care, you can put 10 of us together in a room and give us a task, and one of us is going to be superior in that task over the others. Right. That means that that person in that task is the supreme being. So communism precedes theocracy. Claim number three, abandon religion and accept communism. We stipulate again, Professor Clevin, that socialist means to advocate a society of men or groups of men for one common cause. Equality means to be equal in everything. That's right. That description and the description that she was describing of what a revolutionary world would be like, let me tell you something. I almost pulled out my Holy Quran and started shouting. Because the description is, is of the hereafter. Not some pie in the sky after you die. Notice the word, the hereafter. Hereafter what? Hereafter all of those things, those evil, wicked things you talked about are wiped away. We're going to be here. So when you look in the Bible, it says that I saw a new Jerusalem coming from the heaven to the earth. He said there'd be a new heaven and a new earth. So look here. Why are you so busy trying to get up in the sky? Up in the sky when everything's coming back down here to earth. Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. So we're not trying to go up in the sky. Ain't nothing up there but space lab and, 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 and satellites and a bunch of space junk. Ain't nothing up there. I hope y'all understand that. Auntie and all them are not up there in the sky. It's going to be all right. <laughs> Religion practiced properly leads to communalism or communism. Practice properly. These are the golden rules. You want for your brother or your sister what you want for yourself. That sounds like what she was talking about. If you have a bowl of soup and your brother has none, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that he has half of yours. Right. That sounds like what she was talking about. Do unto others, others, that don't mean just males, do unto females as you would have them done unto you. That sounds like what she was talking about. So our counterclaim is it doesn't matter what you profess, communism or religion, it matters what you practice. Right. The Prophet Muhammad said mere belief accounts for nothing unless it's carried into practice. Our experience with El Comandante Fidel Castro in Cuba was one that reminds us of two servants. One said that he would do the master's will and did not. The other one said that he would not do the master's will and he did it. America believes in God, claims to be a Christian nation in some quarters, says it believes in God. On his money, he says, in God we trust. Don't trust in the money. You've got to trust in that God. You might as well trust in that mystery God for you trust in this money that's not backed with gold. <laughs> Y'all Yo, ain't hearing me. Okay. <laughs> she says she believes in God, but yet 90 million out of 300 million people are functionally illiterate. She says she believes in God, yet there's 48 million people without health care. 
She says she believes in God, but only the elite can afford to get an education. And those of you who are in school here at the great Texas Southern University, you know when you leave out of here, you got a boatload of debt. So you can't afford to be a revolutionary because you got to get a job. And you can't be out there picking in and marching with us. That's all right. I'm a free black man. I'll stand there for you. But I'm getting a little old and I need some help, yo. Pay off them debts and come on out there and join the front lines with the other revolutionaries. But only the elite, here's a country where only the elite can afford an education. But yet in Cuba, on the other hand, does not have a God or a state religion. But yet they got 100% literacy. They have free health care for life. And an education from preschool through PhD. When Minister Farrakhan's delegation went to Cuba, we were offered 500 free scholarships, medical scholarships for our students to live and study medicine in Cuba. We thank El Comandante for that, and we're taking him up on that right as I speak. Communism, like religionists, believe in the unseen. The Holy Quran says, I Allah am the best knower. He said, this book, there is no doubt in it. It is a guide for those who keep their duty who believe in the unseen. <laughs> Communists believe in the unseen. Doesn't mean that it's unreal, it's just you don't see it. Science or religion, if you believe in freedom, if you believe in justice, if you believe in equality, and you lived in this world, you've never seen it. I don't care whether it was the best times of China, the best times of Russia, the best times of America, the best times of whatever government that's been on this earth for the last 6,000 years, Muslim, Christian, agnostic, atheist, I don't care what has been run by women, the Amazons of women, I don't care who ran the bit. It was, you've never seen freedom, justice, and equality. You've never seen it. So you believe in something that doesn't exist. The state may be your God, and Marx may be his messenger. I don't know. I say Allah is God and Muhammad is his messenger. What's the difference? I don't see freedom. I don't see equality. I don't see justice. But I keep fighting for it every day. So I close by saying these things, in fact, do not exist yet. Yet we believe in what we've never seen. Who then is the irrational one? Let me uh, answer some of these things that have been said, and then I'll close, and we can go to questions and answers. <coughs> Opi uh, religion can be the opiate of the masses and has been used to oppress people. But religion has also been the methamphetamines of the masses. <laughs> and when you look at the Bible and Holy Quran, for me, it is a guidebook for a revolution. Because you can go into it from cover to cover, and I want you to understand that 75% of what you read in the New Testament is not history, it's prophecy. And two-thirds of what's in the Old Testament is not history, it's prophecy. Right. It's just written in metaphor and simile. It's written, written in word pictures. So that as it says in the scriptures, I, I thank thee, Father, for hiding this from the wise and prudent men and revealing it onto babes. So the question has to be, if I don't want to believe in this, in this God anthropomorphic or, or uh, immaterial or whatever, but I'm looking at this book, and it's the only book I've got, what does the book say? The book says that... Those who are oppressed shall be free. In the end of the book, I know all that blood letting goes on in front, but in the end of the book it says, he who is taken and takes into captivity shall be led into captivity. That's what it says. Now, this woman-man thing. In the beginning, our teaching is God, first act of creation, was woman. So the woman is not the woman of man. The woman is the woman of God. And from God and the woman came humanity. That's what all the ancient teachings teach. They teach when you talk about hermaphrodite, you talk about Hermes and, and, and Andro, uh, Androcida and all them, you know, all them Greek names. They are the duality of fire and water. The woman represents, the woman represents matter. The man, the male is represented in energy. So we never believe that there's some energy floating out here in space. We believe that energy and matter go together. That's right. Because E equals MC squared, 
really in truth, well, you know, it not proves the reality of God. Because energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, which simply says to us that as an object travels faster and faster towards the speed of light, mm -hmm. it hits the gamma factor, mm -hmm. which means when it gets 99.9% .9 to mm -hmm. the speed of light, it can go no faster. Right. Because it has gathered so much mass, it literally is frozen. It begins to slow down. Mm -hmm. Matter is energy that is frozen. So when you unfreeze that energy or crack the atom, you release all of the energy it took to make that one atom of energy. And that's what he discovered in the explosion of the atomic bomb. It's one atom that caused the, the explosion at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So what we have to understand is, is that God is not some spook outside of matter. He has no, no immaterial God has anything that he wants to do with a material universe. That's some old crazy teaching to enslave you. So that he could get all of his riches on the earth. So when you and I was on a plantation, we said, Master, Master, when am I going to have a nice house like you got? He said, Leroy, and you know Leroy, Leroy means in French is the king, Leroy. Leroy, <laughs> when you die, you're going to have a nice house like this. For real, Master, yeah. When am I going to have some shoes like you, Master? He said, Leroy, when you die, when am I going to get a, stop playing this old wash bucket? He said, when, when, you, when, you, when you go to heaven, Leroy. <laughs> but see, black people weren't stupid. Even in our songs, we had liberation songs. Yes. So we had to hide what we were doing, so we did it in religion. Religion was liberating for us, and so we sung songs like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Coming for to Carry Me Home. Yeah, we wasn't talking about no chariot. We weren't talking about Elijah's chariot. He said, when I looked over yonder, when I see a band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home, we wasn't talking about going over to Jordan and all that. That was code language for a swing low, sweet Harriet, as in Tubman. Come get me and take me north. And I don't care how much that lying, no good preacher was lying to us, telling us all these lies of fairy tales out this book. We didn't believe that crap. That's right. That's why we sung in Negro Spiritual. It said, I got a crown. You got a crown. All the God's children got a crown. When I get to heaven, I'm going to wear my crown. I'm going to walk all over God's heaven. Heaven. But then he said, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Heaven. We knew that that lying, no good snake tongue, fork tongue, lying, no good demon in the name of God wasn't going to know heaven if there was one. We weren't stupid. We sung liberation songs. Mary, don't you weep, tell Martha not to mourn. Why is Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea? Mary and Martha are two New Testament figures. What they have to do with Moses and the Red Sea? Mm. Mary and Martha are the sisters of Lazarus. Lazarus laid in the grave four days, he's stinking. Who is Lazarus? Lazarus is lazy us. Who laid in the mouth of a grave and our sisters, our women are crying. Now, you may have the option. You may have the option of same-sex marriage, and in America, you can do that. But we don't have the option, because six out of ten of our households are headed by females. We got to have some brothers for the sisters. And we got to have some sisters for the brothers. I cannot raise another generation with this do-your-own-thing yeah, all that. No, we're not following you. Do what you want to do. That's freedom. That's real freedom. But what you mean by freedom is license to do what the heck you want to do. So she can have a baby or not because a nation can rise no higher than this woman. And anybody that mistreats a woman, they mistreat the whole nation. So what she said, I'm offended by, not because she said it, because it's true. And we have to do a better job in the name of religion or non-religion. And I close and I say this. Paul said, prove all things and hold fast to what is true. Mm. He said, prove all things. He didn't say some of them. So you can take this book or my book or any book on his face if you want to. But in some cases, we should submit until understanding comes. Yes, Let me tell you something. I, if I was all of you, I would practice Islam tonight. I would leave out of here and all y'all would practice Islam. If you practice Islam, it's a scientific, mathematical, statistical fact that you'll be less likely to catch swine flu. <laughs> I guarantee you. I guarantee you. What other direction from the 
CDC. Wash your hands. A Muslim prays five times a day and you talk to wash five times a day and take a bath if you just wash up. Maybe you'll skip the prayers, but just wash up five times a day and you'll be less likely to catch swine flu. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum. We don't have any questions after those two presentations. <laughs> you have to uh, we have another speaker over there, I think. So if there are questions from the audience, uh, we'll, I guess, hand the speaker to you, that you ask your question, then bring it back so it can be answered. I remember one time a friend introduced me to another person and said, oh, uh, did you know so-and-so is an atheist. The woman was genuinely shocked and she said, oh, she can't be an atheist. And I guess because I had done so much work uh, for the mission of Yahweh at, at work. Um, so my question is, do you think that because a person doesn't believe in God that they are immoral? Because I think that's a lot of people think they look at an atheist and they think they must be immoral. So that's my question. I guess uh, that person sorry. Yeah. You know, no, I, I maybe we'll have the same answer. No. I gave you the example of Fidel Castro. And 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 right there. You know, if you look if you judge him by the scripture, judge him by the scripture in Matthew twenty five. He said, Jesus said, when I was hungry, when you fed me not. When I was thirsty, you gave me not drink. When I was naked, you clothed me not. When I was homeless, you gave me not shelter. When I was in prison and when I was in the hospital, you ministered not unto me. They said, Master, when did we not do these things unto you? In so much as you haven't done it for the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. So when I look at El Comandante Fidel Castro and I see that he takes care of, he's got medical care for his people and offered us medical care for all those people that suffered in Katrina. I'm still angry at Bush about that. That's right. I am too. So I'm still angry at Bush about that. And when I think about Fidel Castro and all of the, uh, uh, the, the oppressionists that were in Southern Africa, Jonas Zimbi and all those, those people in Angola and whatnot that was trying to rob all the riches of the black people. And he sent people over there that died in the jungles of Africa to liberate our people. I love Fidel Castro. That's right. That's right. Now he may not believe in God, but I love him. And I stand side by side with him. And the whole thing about preparing this presentation is, is that I had to walk a fine line. So what I did was I gave you a little anesthesia before I gave you the message because many of you in this audience, we have marched, picketed, fought, cried together over liberation of poor people. Now you go to your meeting, I go to the mob. But when it comes to them front lines, we are one. So I, I'm saying no, you, I don't think so. Well, I wanna, um, you responded to a few of the things that I said, and I wanna respond to a couple of the things that you said in your presentation, and then we'll open it back up to questions. But I have to go back to the, which I really enjoyed your presentation as well. Um, but I wanna go back to this thing of, of, of Stevie Wonder. Believing in things that you don't understand, then you suffer, and this is superstition. And then you made the point, disbelieving in things you don't understand is ignorance. But I have to challenge the logic there. Because I could say there's a big pink unicorn right here. You can't see him. You can't touch him. You could say, well, you don't believe he's there. And by the same criteria you just put forward, I could say, but you don't really understand him. And you could, you know, it's, you could do that with all kinds of levels of absurdity. There's a big dinosaur coming from the back of the place. He's fire breathing and he's invisible. And if you don't all, like, give me $20 each, he's going to eat you. You would insist that I prove that, that I offer evidence of it. And, of course, I can say to you, well, you can't disprove my dinosaur. And you couldn't disprove it because there's no evidence of it. You cannot disprove something for which there's no evidence, for which there's no reality. It's, it's utter fabrication. Now, I can make up all kinds of different things, and they could be so complex you can't figure out what I'm talking about, but that doesn't make them, just because you disbelieve it without understanding it does not mean that you don't have, ev you cannot prove that I made it up. 
And I think this is this is good. It stumps people a lot of the time because in in the world you have to if you're asserting something you have to offer evidence of it. Mm -hmm. Like I was just giving the examples, and with religion it gets flipped in people's minds because we all grow up religion. People are told you can't disprove God, and it's true you can't disprove God because God does not exist and there's never been any evidence of it. Now what I can prove and what atheists can prove and what historians can prove is that different human societies make up different gods at different times. And we can prove why did the, we can go and, dis, and, and study why did the Greek societies have many gods? And why at a different point in human society at the time of emerging empires did it become important to bring forward monotheistic religions? This, is, they, this has a lot to do with why Muhammad was able to spread his teachings because he was cohering an empire and bringing together different tribes who were not cohered before. There was rising trade in Mecca. There was a social purpose that served. This is why that religion's only been around 1,500 years or so. Before that, that God didn't exist. That notion of God didn't exist. That changed when human societies changed and gods made it. humans made up new gods. And you can go through all the religious beliefs like that to prove that they were fabricated. And then just the last thing I want to say on this, because I know we're both fighting for emancipation, and, and I'm glad you liked my vision of a revolutionary society in a communist world. And I, and I heard you when you said you wanted to pick up your Quran and say, yeah, I'm with you. But I have to say the vision in the Quran is very different than the vision I was talking about. Really? Yes, it is. I mean, I know you know the Quran better than me, but, and I will not contest that. But my understanding is, in the Quran, there's a lot of discussion of, of in, in, in heaven, or whatever, the hereafter, however you want to call it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm learning. But in the hereafter, that there's going to be shade, there's going to be breeze, and all of these things. Now, I'm bringing this up because to me, I like shade and breeze when you're in the summer and the sun. But this is not a core element of my vision of a liberated society. Why is it so many times mentioned in the Quran? Because that was a, that was a vision brought forward by people who lived in the Arabian desert. Mm -hmm. And they lived before air conditioning was invented. <laughs> if they live now and they wanted to, they, they would say, when, in the hereafter, we'll all have AC. But they didn't because they lived in a different historical epoch. So, they, so the inventions and the myths they came up with reflected the times in which they lived. And they also reflected over and over again the repeat that there will be maidens with almond-shaped eyes and all of this. That, re that reflects the patriarchy of the authors of the Bible. So we can talk about this, I mean of the Quran, I'm sorry. Anyway, so, okay, he's, you can raise I'm, 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 just, I'm just telling you, it, that's not in there. Uh, and it's okay, it's okay that, um, they say that it talks about youth never altering with age, but it's not talking about women with almond eyes and all that. That again, that's the Orientalists that write that kind of stuff. Here is the point: before Muhammad received his revelation, <coughs> the Arabs that were in Arabia are not the original inhabitants of that peninsula. That's right. The people who were there long before them were people who were black and soot. And they worship a God that they called Allah or Allah that was before, long before that. Now Allah was the was the, the God that was uh, the single God over them all. And his biggest fight was against pagans and polytheists, people who believed in many gods. So I agree that uh, in so much as, of course, uh, if you're living in the desert and the only thing you have is 120 degrees in the heat, and the only thing you see is, is, is your camel looking at you in the morning. Of course you want to have gardens where the river flows. But, but think about what you want. You're trying to imagine a world without war that shares its food, that has no charge for people being in, uh, taken care of medically, that people get what they need and provide the work to society that they work, now, where does that exist? That's your heaven in your mind. That doesn't exist. So for the for the, the seventh century Arab, that was heaven. And for what you're saying in 2009, that's your heaven. Call it science if you want to. Remember, what was yesterday's science fiction is today's science fact. For someone to say that a man could fly would have been science fiction, but now you got here on a plane. For someone to tell you in the Quran and in the Bible, because there's, there's much science in both those books, that man comes from a clot. So we talk about sperm mixed with ovum, a clot, 
embryo, fetus, all of these things. Here's an illiterate man that a God is talking to him. So a man is actually talking to him, telling him these things. He's telling him science. Right. So now what you have is a situation in the books where you have to decode what's in it. And if you decode what's in it and understand that, again, like I said, 75% of it is prophecy, meaning we're fulfilling it as we live. You just got to take the characters. It's like a script. That's why they call it scripture. So take out Babylon, put in America. Take out the, the, the Hebrews, uh, children of Israel, and put us in that place. Take out the uh, uh, Pharaoh and put George Bush. Take out America and put in Egypt. We're fulfilling, we're living it right now. And so what we're discussing right now is probably what they discussed because when they made the exodus out of that land of bondage, they left out with a mixed multitude. That means everybody wasn't the children of Israel. Everybody wasn't a believer when they left out for the promised land. We've been uh, going for about an hour and 15 minutes, but if you got the energy, uh, I'm ready for more. So uh, I want to give people a chance to ask uh, some questions. Two quick things before that, though. Uh, there's a questionnaire that we left on everyone's chair, uh, and if you care to fill it out, uh, we'd appreciate your thoughts. Uh, the second is that uh, we uh, need some funds to uh, pay for the expenses of uh, having this meeting, so... Uh, let me do that. I was going to say, let, let, let me do that. that. You sound like a college professor. <laughs> <laughs> now you need a preacher. All right. <laughs> Look at it. Let me tell y'all something. These, they work very hard. Sandy Joe and Emilio and the whole crew, Travis and all of them, work very hard. To Mr. Travis, he's he gone on the way. Up. That's my main man, though. Me and Travis, boy, that was my main man. But they worked really hard to put this on. You got a small basket. You must don't believe. All right. <laughs> but what I'm asking you to do is to give tonight, you know, and I'm not showing off, but here, here. Look, put something in there. Put something really, there's something that folds and something that rolls. But put something in there because I want to make sure that they get the, all the bills paid and they take care of the business because we can't set back the, the mission just because there's some theists and some atheists up in here debating. We still need that money. So as we pass the receptacle, give what you can and please help us. And we got the brothers watching the basket go goes by so don't get no sticky fingers. <laughs> but this is true. And don't worry about, and, and write a check for and can, Sandy Joe. Sandy, can they write a check? Yes. You, you got a checking account? You want, not to me. He wants to write a check. Man might want to write a big check. I don't know. Checks can be made out. This is to support the travel and the tour that I've been on to Sansara's world. It's like, um, if we had a whiteboard, I'd write it down. Sansara's world, S-U-N-S-A-R-A, apostrophe S, world. Um, and it's to cover the, the hat, to cover the event, and then pay for the organizing. You know this wasn't free. Yep. <laughs> you know what, nothing free about that, because there is no mystery God. <laughs> it's real, everything's real. We believe in that. So get the energy to put your hand in your pocket, <laughs> and in your purse, and go ahead and please give to this effort. You went with a question over here. Yes, I would like to know what is the origin of your belief, and how long has it been in existence? Okay. Um, everybody heard her? No. She asked, what is the origin of my belief, and how long has it been in existence, my belief? Okay. Um, do you mean how long have I believed the way I do, or how long has the belief system that I am a part of been around? The former, how long have I believed? Um, I became an atheist when I was maybe, I think I was about 20, um, so about a decade ago. Um, and, you know, like I said, I grew up religious, but one of the things that happened is, besides reading Bible quotes that disturbed me and then being challenged to confront them, one of the things that preceded that is, I remember when I was in junior high or high school, I was hanging out with the Young Life Christian Club, and um, this was right when the first abortion doctor was killed down in Pensacola, Florida. And he was killed by a Christian fundamentalist gunman. 
And I remember being so horrified. And a lot of people were very shocked at that time. And my family was very upset. I was very upset. And I went to school the next day. And all of my friends in the Christian Young Life Club were talking. Everybody was talking about it. But they had more sympathy with the gunman than with the doctor. Because they were taught that abortion is a sin, abortion is murder, and that, that this was saving, quote unquote, babies' lives. And this very much disturbed me, that somebody would go to the, the, to the extent of killing a doctor. And so I thought, these people must not be real Christians, because Christianity, I thought, was about love and, and acceptance and toleration. And so I kept thinking <coughs> this for a long time. And when I got to college, I went actually and defended an abortion clinic um, up in Fargo, North Dakota. It was the last abortion clinic in the whole state. And there was about 300 people from Operation Rescue. They were like vehement, violent protesters there to shut down the clinic. And still Christian. Most of the people were not Christian who were defending the clinic. So I, I did what none of them did. I went and I, and I went into the church and I listened to, the, to them preach. I wanted to understand them. How could they be doing this if they were Christians? And I went and there that guy went through. His name was Flip Benham. And he quoted every Bible scripture I'd ever pushed aside. And I, and I stood there and I had to listen to the fact that he actually can marshal the Bible to make his argument. If you go to the Bible, there is all kinds of justification for enforcing women to have babies. That's our duty in the Bible. That's our duty. Um, there is no... Uh, there's no, uh, in the Bible, condemning of killing in the universal sense. There's no, there's no code in the Bible for the universal preservation of life the way the quote-unquote pro-life movement claims. There's actually all kinds of murder and plunder commanded. You kill people for worshiping the wrong gods. You kill people for worshiping the right god and worshiping in the wrong way. Sometimes God sends down plagues just to show off. You know, he kills a lot of people. There's all kinds of, and then women are given away. Lot gives his daughters away to be raped. There's all this stuff I had to confront. But the Bible actually can be used as a force to enslave women and take away our reproductive rights, take away our right to be a full participant in society, to be something beyond a breeder of children and property of men. But the Bible cannot be a code for emancipating women and emancipating humanity. And this was, to me, a big challenge that made me have to rethink the Bible. I read some of Baba Bacon's earlier works. Um, and then from there, you know, I have to say the, the ultimate breaking point for me was I was sort of getting over Christianity and exploring other religions, thinking maybe there's some Buddhism, maybe some other kind of spirituality. And, a friend, and you know, I was learning a little bit about it, but one of the things, people in this country have no idea what Buddhism actually means for people in the countries where it's the dominant religion. And it backs up feudal, patriarchal, enslaving institutions there. Um, but a friend of mine who was an atheist and a communist one day just said, look, if you can understand that the, that the God of the Christian Bible is absurd, why can't you see that all these other gods are absurd too? And he just went through them, and, and, and I realized that I couldn't defend the existence of any of the gods that I had been taught about, that they were all made up, like I said before, by human beings at different points in human history, reflecting the times in which they lived. So ever since then, I've been an atheist. But it wasn't, just not to go for too much longer, but I, this is the important part, is that it wasn't until I understood how harmful belief in religion is to people understanding and changing the world that I decided it was important to go out and fight for atheism. Because if it was just a matter of personal belief, it would be just a matter of my belief, your belief, whatever. But actually people are trained to do things that are harmful because the Bible tells them so, or because other religious scriptures tell them so. And they do things, frankly, which otherwise they would never do. That otherwise they would be able to see are immoral, like opposing gay marriage. What, I mean, on what basis?